I, probably houses. <laughs> I'll let you know if I see one. You let me know if you see one. Deal. Yeah. This is the ESV. Yep. Yep. That's a good question. This is the ESV. All right. Well, this morning we're going to be in the book of Colossians. So if you are able, would you stand for the reading of God's word? We're going to be in Colossians chapter the first. Colossians chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 14 this morning. Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Colossians 1, verses 1 through 14. You're welcome. All right. Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed the whole world is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved ser fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Oh Lord, we thank you for this truth. We thank you for this truth about who you are and what you have done. And we ask that you would send us forth into every heart to accomplish your purposes. In Jesus' strong name we pray. Amen. Welcome to have a seat. So we are going to embark on a journey through the book of Colossians, starting now. Today, I'll, I'll be introducing the book. Next Sunday, St. David of Gloucester, America's oldest seaport, will be proclaiming a message to help you grow in the faith from the Word of God. So look forward to that. And then the following week, I'll continue with the book of Colossians. So to put the idea out there, and I'll say this again at the end, if I remember, it could be a swell idea to read through this short book. Let it ruminate in your mind, dwell on it, and let the Lord speak to you through it. Uh, and, and ponder it, because we'll be on it for a while. And the more you let the scripture soak into your mind, the better. And that is a good thing. So we are on this journey through Colossians. This letter from Paul, it also mentions Timothy here. 
But when we go through the book, you'll see that the personal pronoun I is used a lot. And, and many people believe it's most or, mostly or completely written by Paul. This letter from Paul to the Colossians, this group of people whom, at least at the time of writing this, he had never actually met. Some of the letters that Paul wrote were to people who he knew well, to people who he had interacted with before and might have known very well, not so with the Colossians. He's writing these to people. Uh, many of these people who have, uh, who have received this, maybe all of them, had never actually met Paul before. So what's his connection with the Colossians? We will consider that as we go down the text a bit more. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God, our Father. Paul greets them with a greeting similar to greetings of other letters at that time, but specifically wishing them grace and peace from God the Father. And ultimately, that is a focus in this letter, that grace and peace come from the Lord Jesus. This is a letter that focuses on the supremacy of Christ, the sufficiency of Christ, and the centrality of Christ. I'm not just trying to be fancy by using lots of words that begin with a s sound. In fact, I was trying to think of words that are good, and those are the three that came to mind. So, but either way, the focus is on Christ. And that's a good focus for any time, isn't it? Strange times, normal times, and everything in between. A focus on Christ. And Paul is writing this letter that describes who Jesus is, what he's done, that, that these people have everything they need in Christ. And the letter counters a heresy that these believers are experiencing. And we don't exactly know 100% what this heresy was. Some people uh, focus that it could be a, an early form of this Gnos the spiritual view of Gnosticism, of the physical world being evil, and this, this higher spiritual thinking, and others point to the Jewish legalism, and some say it could be a combination of the two. We'll talk more about both of those as time goes on but we can't be totally dogmatic about exactly what the heresy was. However, we can be dogmatic about who Jesus is. And the good thing is, when we study about who Jesus is, even if we don't know every detail of what false spiritual view are coming toward the Colossians, we're still going to be on solid ground if we know more about who Jesus is. So as we go through this book, I hope that you are looking forward to the Lord reminding us, refreshing us, strengthening our foundation of who Jesus is, the work that he's done, who we are in him. Let's work our way down through this text. I'm going to read verses 3 through 7. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed the whole world, it, it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us 
your love in the Spirit. Now we're going to consider this morning the power of the gospel and the power of prayer. The power of the gospel and the power of prayer. Consider the power of the gospel and the work and the, and say, and that the Lord does in saving someone and strengthening them and working in them and through them throughout their life. So Paul is writing this letter while he is under arrest by the Romans. This would be one of his prison epistles, as they say. And he has heard about, he's familiar with what these Colossians are going through. Evidently, during one of Paul's missionary journeys when he went to Ephesus, this fellow Epaphras came, who, who lived in Colossae, came to Ephesus and heard the gospel, became a believer, and then went back to Colossae. We learn this, we get these, this idea from Colossians and from the book of Acts. And so, some people believe that he perhaps went to Colossae where he lived, proclaimed the gospel to others, shared the good news, people came to Christ, and he started a church in Colossae. And, there, and there's the Colossian church. So it was not started by Paul, as some of these other churches that we read about were, but probably by Epaphras. And he came and visited Paul in Rome now and filled him in on what's going on. So Paul is writing this letter to these faithful brothers, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ. But he knows that there is some false teaching coming in, so he wants to strengthen them. He has this burden on his heart as an apostle to still have a shepherding role of this church, which he did not plant, and he was not pastoring, but he still was overseeing, in a sense, and reaching out to them and helping them in the faith. Consider the great power that's in the gospel. It's like the parable of the sower that Jesus told, where a man goes out and sows seeds, the seeds being the word. And the seeds go out, they fall on different types of soil, and you never know what type. Maybe it will spring up and there'll be thorns or shallow soil or be plucked up by the birds, not have a chance to sing in, sink in. Or it could be the type of seed that, fall, the seed that falls on the good type of soil and sinks in. Perhaps that is like what happened with Epaphras. And it can be what happens with us when our hearts is, are right. And it can be what happens with other people to whom we share the gospel with. This man heard the gospel. He went, evidently, from what we can tell, and shared the gospel. And now there's this church in Colossae, and they're, they're taking in the word, they're growing in the faith. And now we have this letter that has been influencing believers for, that, for a couple thousand years, millions and millions of believers over the years. And just think of the faithfulness of one person in doing that. So don't be discouraged if you're giving out the gospel and many are not receiving it because there could be that one who does. And that could be the seed that sprouts up 30, 60, or 100 fold. And it's worth it. It's worth it all for that one seed. Maybe it's a person who you're investing in. Maybe it's someone who's already a believer and you're investing and, you're, and you are not one who planted the seed, but you are one who is watering a seed and you're helping that person to grow in the faith and that person can do a great work in the kingdom. The gospel is powerful indeed. It is powerful. And we see that Paul writes here that in verse 6, which has come to you, that is the faith, the gospel, as indeed the whole world it is bearing fruit 
and increasing as it also does among you. The gospel is increasing. It's bearing fruit. And this doesn't necessarily mean that it was it went forth to all continents at this part, but it had in, uh, with, in a short time since Pentecost, uh, it had spread to different cities and they see it's going forth. It's spreading. It's going to different lives. People are coming to Christ. The power of the gospel. The gospel is powerful indeed. Prayer is powerful. Now at this part, we're going to look at this prayer that Paul had been praying for the Colossians. This isn't some, something that Paul's telling us to do something. We'll get into that. We'll see more of that as we go through the book. In this case, we're just looking at this prayer that he prayed, and we're considering his heart, which I'm confident to say is a reflection of the Lord's heart here for these Colossians. So consider this. Do you have a friend a family member, a spouse, a mouse, not a mouse, not a mouse. That doesn't count. Uh, you could pray for a mouse, I guess, but not for conversion, I don't think. But for, uh, we won't talk about that now, though. Do you have a friend or loved one who knows the Lord and you're wondering how you can pray for them? Perhaps you are a bit out of touch with them. Perhaps you are in touch and you just don't know how to pray for them. Hey, here's an idea. Consider what Paul was praying for these believers. And so, he says in verse 9, From the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to God the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in Light. Now we really could take this prayer and pray this. You could take this very prayer and pray this for somebody. In fact, there's a rather similar prayer in Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. You could go there uh, by yourself or on your own time. I'm not going to flip there now. That's also a similar one you could pray. We could pray Psalms. And can, can you go to the scripture and with a sincere heart, pray verbatim the words here for someone? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, some people might say, nay, that sounds like rote religion to me. You should be more spontaneous. In fact, you should not even set your alarm in the morning. You should wake up whenever the Holy Spirit wakes you up. Now, that might work for you. For me, I would get fired from any job that I have <laughs> and be late for everything and miss all appointments. Well, maybe not all if they're in the middle of the day, but that's neither hither nor tither. Do you have to pray it rote, word for word? No. But you certainly can, as long as it's sincere. The Lord knows your heart. <coughs> now, notice what Paul prays for these believers. So he's, he's praying for the, from, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. So he's praying this over and over. I don't know if he's praying the exact words, but this is the heart. That he's praying for these people regularly. So consider this as we Start on Colossians, and you think this is what Paul's praying for these people. Uh, and let that soak into your mind to understand his heart for these people, what they were going through. But it can be relevant to us too, to you personally. And if you 
want to pray for somebody. This would be a good thing to pray for someone who knows the Lord. From the day we have heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Spiritual wisdom and understanding. So that's really spiritual wisdom. That's wisdom and understanding given by the Holy Spirit. Once upon a time, I sat down to dine with a fellow at the Plymouth State University dining hall when I was a student there. And he said, I really want to have a spiritual experience. He was a seeker. He was a seeker. Where is he now? I know not. I hope he knows the Lord now. But I don't think this was really what he meant when he said that. I really want to have a spiritual experience. It was a good conversation. I'll tell you about it sometime, perhaps. But spiritual, that's a loaded word, isn't it? Spiritual wisdom. Maybe we should put a spiritual wisdom and understanding. Come on in to hell and bring all kinds of... <laughs> We maxed out the seating capacity. They're coming to shut us down. But a uh, spiritual advisor, I saw that advertised outside. Some, so I guess I'm a spiritual advisor. But that's not really what we mean. Spiritual wisdom and understanding. Wisdom and understanding from the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Paul wanted these Colossians to be filled with knowledge of the will of God through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Un wisdom and understanding given by the Holy Spirit to know the will of God. Now, I have shared this analogy or this illustration before because I think it illustrates it in such an excellent way. This is something I heard from John MacArthur. He is a pastor. You probably know who he is. I heard him describe it this way. Many people, when they want to know the will of God, they believe the will of God is something ambiguous and vague, and that to find God's will, you must kind of like walk around groping about in the darkness while God, as if he's some cosmic Easter bunny, says, you're getting warmer, you're getting warmer. And, and that's the, the will of God is right here for us. He has revealed his will. He has revealed his will to us. Now, there is the unknown will of God, such as, you know, I don't know where that guy go, is going, that guy in the big funky van that drove by. God does. Does God have a plan? Does, is, is, within God's sovereignty, does God know and, and is, is he ultimately in control of where that guy is going? Like, could he drive to Albuquerque right now if God has declared that he's not going to? No, but I don't know. I don't know where he's going. That, that's okay. I don't have to. You don't have to. We don't have to figure out God's will that he has not revealed to us. Now, there are some things that, that he guides us into. There are some things that we, we need to uh, pray about and, and figure out and, and walk out in our faith in daily, li in daily life. But this is speaking of that, that God wants to help us to understand his will. He has revealed his will. What, what makes him happy, what he desires, he's revealed this to us. And the Holy Spirit will help us to understand this in wisdom and knowledge. And why do we have the spiritual wisdom and understanding? So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. That's why God reveals his will to us, so that we can walk in a manner worthy of him, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's the life God wants us to be living, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, many times people become very interested in the unrevealed 
will of God. What's out there? But they're not too interested in the revealed will of God, which is kind of, I like to give this illustration. I made this one up. I hope it's good. It's sort of like Lydia writing me a list of things to get at the grocery store. And I take the list and I put it in my pocket and, and I get to the grocery store, I take it, I look at the list and I'm like, I wonder what she wants that she didn't put on this list. So I spend hours walking around in the grocery store thinking, like picking up random things that I don't even know what they are and just thinking, I wonder if she would like this. Like these spices, I don't even know what they taste like. I don't even know what kind of food they go on. And I'm so consumed with that that I don't even get the things that she put on the list. In fact, I didn't even, I only took a cursory glance at the list and then I didn't even try to get anything on that. And, there, and that, it's as ridiculous as it is. That's how we can be sometimes when we are, oh God. I'm here at water country. Ooh, I'm feeling spiritual. I want you to show me definitively which water slide I should go down first. And, and their friend's like, God, oh, did you read your Bible today? No, I've been just seeking the Lord about which water slide to go down first. Oh, okay. Did you read your Bible yesterday? Oh, no. I was still just seeking the Lord. I was fasting. I anointed myself with oil. I anointed myself with vinegar and cinnamon just for good measure. And I am just seeking the Lord about what water slide to go down. Do you know that it's October and that you climbed over the fence and the police are coming to arrest you for criminal trespassing and the water country's closed? Yes, but I'm still just praying about this. All right. That's unprofitable. And the point is, the Lord's revealed to us his will. Be in the word. Be in the, Lord. Be in the word. Spend time with the Lord. Soak in the word of God. And, and pray for others that they may have this spiritual understanding and knowledge to understand the will of God, to live a holy life, to live a life that's pleasing to him. Let's just pretend water country was open and you didn't have to break into it. I don't think, now some people would say this makes me uh, like a, a, a just dusty old cessationist, super Baptist, but I don't think God minds too much which water slide you go down first. I don't think, unless he somehow put that on your heart and like made that very clear to you, I don't think he, I think you have the free will liberty to choose which water slide you go down first, especially if you're there by yourself and you're not even there with anybody. But if you're there by yourself and the employees aren't there, then you should question why you are there at all. But that brings us to the point that we must go on. Be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every... Wait a minute. Let's pause there for a second. Fully pleasing to him... This is why we get the spiritual wisdom and understanding. This is important, especially as we think about Colossians, because thinking about all these different spiritual views that were around then and are around now, many times people think that the idea of being spiritual is a means in and of itself. That is, the point of being spiritual is to be spiritual. You can be enlightened. If you get spiritual enough, then you can be one of the enlightened ones who are in touch with yourself and the universe and Macaulay Culkin. Maybe not Macaulay Culkin, but they, they see you as in touch with it. No, it's not about you. Well, I mean, it's about your relation with God. So, so it is to that effect. It's not about the universe. It's not about Macaulay Culkin. 
It's about the Lord and living a life that's pleasing to him. Living a life that's pleasing to the Lord. He gives us spiritual wisdom and understanding, not just to heap up spirituality and become some guru who lives you know, on top of a roof and is so spiritual they attract the seagulls and speak to them or something, but rather that we can live a life that pleases the Lord in obedience to him. Spiritual wisdom and understanding to understand, understand what God's will is. And we know we need that spiritual understanding, don't we? reading the Bible without the Holy Spirit's aid is, uh, it might just seem like it's a book of rules or a book of history or something. But when we ask the Lord to help us to understand it, ask the Spirit, the Holy Spirit to give us this spiritual wisdom and understanding, ask him, ask him to give it to somebody else, a believer who you know, this is something you could be praying for them, that they may understand the will of God. So they may live a manner of life that is pleasing to the Lord. Picking up in verse 11, being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience, with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Paul is praying this for the Colossians that God would strengthen them with power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. For all endurance and patience with joy. And that is what the Christian life takes, isn't it? Endurance with patience. And the fruit of the fruit of the Spirit, that's joy. The fruit of the Spirit, that's patience. Through the Spirit, long suffering. These are essential for life as we follow Christ. It's essential for our individual lives because we know when we follow the Lord that it's not really that we become a Christian and it's just an uphill victory march all the time. And we know that there are times when there are seasons the Lord takes us through that take patience endurance, that we need to lean on him to have joy. We need that power that comes from him to have those things. It's true for a body of Christ, like the church at Colossae, like higher ground. We need these things. We need the power, the power that the Lord gives us. We need to be strengthened with him for all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy as a body of believers, endurance and patience with joy. That's what we need as a body of Christ together as we journey through. That's what every church needs. And how important it is that we remember that because we'll go through different seasons where things are more exciting or maybe more difficult, more challenging. And as the Lord takes us through, that's, what's, that's what being a family in Christ means it's what being members united together means we're going through it together with patience endurance relying on the lord's power for joy for wherever he takes us and this is ultimately only possible by his grace and we have everything we need in christ for that We'll get to that later, though, as we go through this book. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's what he's done for us. That's what enables us to live out this life, to live out uh, a life of soaking in the spiritual wisdom and knowledge by, by, the, by the Spirit enabling us to understand the will of God so that we can live out a life that pleases the Lord, bearing good works, receiving the power that we need for patient endurance with joy. Amen. 
There's our first portion of the book of Colossians. And I have an assignment. This is a fun assignment. I, I think it would be fun. It's an assignment that is spiritual. Read the book of Colossians. And in fact, there are two assignments. One, read it. And if you please, underline or highlight times when you see in him or in Christ mentioned. How much will you see it? You'll have to find out. The other is pray this prayer or a similar prayer. Again, you can look at Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. That can give you some good ideas too. Pray this each day this week for a brother or sister in Christ. Can it be for my uncle? I think so. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you this day and always. I forgot to close in a prayer, but now I remembered. I shall close in a prayer. A, a, a that's a good question. A believer, someone who is in Christ. Yep. Indeed. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word of truth. We thank you, God, for your love and giving us your son and that we have everything we need for life and godliness in you, Jesus. And we pray, oh God, that you would help us to know you more as we study this book. Help us to know you more, Lord, this day and to walk closely with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Peace of Christ be with you all. Thank you.